Some of you might remember about a year ago on my channel, I had this series called What Happened To? And I would look at uh, abandoned projects or lost projects or forgotten about stuff. And I did one on Gamera 2015, one on the King Kong live action show, uh, and Godzilla vs. the Wolfman was the other one I did. So what happened to the What Happened To? show? Well, in researching episode 4, I fell down a huge rabbit hole. I went to the depths of the internet and articles and articles and articles to find everything I could about the first TriStar attempt at Godzilla, which we call Godzilla vs. the Griffin. So, in researching, I found a lot of things that I hadn't seen on YouTube before. So, I decided to throw them in a documentary. But in gathering all this information, I said, is any of it even true? So, I decided to reach out to somebody who worked on the movie. And he is in this documentary. I have an interview with him on my channel, which I'm going to post after this documentary is out. Uh, it's probably in the end screen, actually, for this. You have to understand that this isn't just like those other Lost Projects. There's a lot of content here. There's a lot of things that they did. There's a lot of people they hired. There's a lot of actual production materials that I'm showing in this uh, this video, which is why I'm calling it a documentary and not a simple 15-minute what happened to speculation video. This is true, and Boyd confirms some of it. He uh, denies some of it, which is also very helpful. So, what happened to Godzilla versus the Griffin? Toho gave the rights of Godzilla to TriStar in 1992. The project for this Godzilla particularly totally fell apart in 1995. So what we have in this video are going to be things from 92 to 95. That be information and obviously sets and production shit. So Henry Saperstein was a guy that was heavily involved in bringing Godzilla to America. He was uh, involved in, you know, producing the American versions of films and distributing the American versions of the films. You know, so like, you know, Godzilla versus the thing instead of Mother versus Godzilla, stuff like that. So he had been doing this for years and years and years. And he was the guy that was in charge of like licensing Godzilla to like Marvel and stuff like that and toy lines. And, uh, the Hanna-Barbera show, he was in charge of getting that done. So... Uh, he was a guy that had been doing this for decades. He was kind of like the American consultant for Godzilla, uh, working with Toho, of course. So he had been pressuring Toho for years to get a Godzilla film in, in Hollywood. That was like his next step and probably his biggest dream. So Toho finally said yes. So he started trying to meet with producers in the early 90s. So he met two guys, Carrie Woods and Robert and fried they were two young producers at the time they'd done some stuff in the early 90s they uh, had also been acting as agents or at least carrie woods had acted as an agent and saperstein went to a meeting with them to do a live action version of mr magoo but when those went away he kind of brought up godzilla the fact that he kind of had the rights available for that it kind of implies that he wasn't starting the conversation with that as if that might be a turnoff However, both producers jumped at it right away, saying, you know, the name is recognizable. And this is around the time where the Charles Barkley commercial came out, Godzilla vs. Charles Barkley, in 1992. And that was a big success, and everyone today knows that commercial. Speaking of, there's a fantastic little 20-minute uh, documentary on how they made that. Friggin' fascinating. But, so, they knew that Godzilla was popular again, and it was a good time for a remake. So, obviously, Carrie Woods and Robert Fried were excited. And they're like, yeah, we'll produce this thing. So, Saperstein was like, I got the rights for you. They're like, we are going to be the producers. We're going to find some studios. When they went to Sony, they pitched to Columbia. That was an outright pass. They basically said, too campy. And then when they went to TriStar, they passed originally. However, they did have Chris Lee, who was a vice president, who was originally a script reader, um, who worked his way up to vice president of production. And he loved the idea. He grew up with the Godzilla movies. He was like, it's something that I've always wanted to see, something that I've dreamed of doing. So Lee agreed to both producers that he would take it on, uh, saying, quote, the creature was not just menacing, he was also mythic. And he wanted a film to be done in the spirit of the first movie, which was not campy at all. So, so this guy obviously knew the origins. He was clearly a fan. So it seemed like they were going in a good direction. 
So the problem was is that, you know, he had a lot of faith in doing this in Hollywood. However, he was only a vice president of production. He didn't have all the power or all the leeway. So he kind of just relied on pressure through the executives to get it done. So with, you know, Chris Lee not having enough power, Woods decided, one of the producers, that he was just going to go to the big boss. He was going to go to the CEO of Sony. He took the risk after his wife told him to go do it. So he decided to go fly to an, a speaking event that he had and approach him. And he was expecting to get basically like fired because you're not supposed to do, you know, that's like breaking protocol. However, when Peter Goober, the CEO, heard you know, Woods talking about Godzilla as an international brand. You know, it could be a series of films. Peter was very excited. He said, quote, Godzilla, the fire-breathing monster? Yes. Which is awesome. So Peter G G Goober himself just set up Godzilla at TriStar. And then he did some stuff where he talked to the, the highest people like Japan's level and Sony on how to negotiate with Toho. So they got kind of all that going. And those those discussions started around 1992. Toho was pretty happy with this deal. They got a down payment of uh, a couple hundred thousand dollars and they had a licensing fee for, you know, all of the, anything that they did with the Godzilla American character. And they also got some profits out of the ticket sales. So this was good for them. So this is an interesting little bit here. Toho gave a big list to TriStar, uh, a document about 75 pages there were rules of you know what to do with the monster and also an explanation of his background but they had like very specific things three rows of dorsal fins four claws in each hand and each foot long tail godzilla can't be made fun of and he cannot die the reason that i say that that's kind of an interesting thing is because we don't exactly know what their contract with the legendary was so could he die in the legendary contract? Maybe, maybe not. Who knows? Probably not after <laughs> 98. Definitely not. Part of their agreement had to do with Toho distributing in Japan and Godzilla being a trademark worldwide. So technically Toho gave TriStar permission to trademark this as Godzilla, which after 98, that was a big fucking mistake. The president of TriStar wasn't happy at all with the way that Woods had approached uh, Goober and like reached over him. But then Goober said, yeah, don't worry about this guy. He's don't let him scare you. We're, we're getting this thing done. So there was a little bit of heat within the company, TriStar. But again, because Sony was the parent company, there really wasn't much they could do about it. So it was announced in 1992, October 29th by Variety that they had the right steal. And it was going to be a big lump of pictures together that were you know, high profile, big budget, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, taking liberty that was never produced, cartooned that was never produced, um, and James Cameron's Spider-Man, obviously made eventually in 2002. There was some rumors and drama about Sony, like, forcing it on TriStar. I'm skipping that because that doesn't really mean anything. But it was officially announced, Godzilla was officially announced in November 1992. They had some ads and some industry publications um, and they planned a worldwide summer 1994 release. So obviously the new Jurassic Park was coming. So they decided this is a great time to put it like the next summer, the next big blockbuster dinosaur movie. And the budget was anticipated around $40 million, which is way more than Toho had been spending on the 90s Heisei films. You know, Ishiro Hondo gave the film his blessing. A couple actors did, a couple producers did. Some of them said that they had mixed feelings about it. <laughs> one one particular guy, um, an actor, Akira Kubo, who was in Son of Godzilla and the Straw Monsters, said, basically, he was afraid that the film technology, the computer graphics, would be too real. <laughs> the old films, there was a little left to the imagination. So, Also, in designing Godzilla, Toho gave a reference drawing of the Godzilla vs. King Ghidorah 1991 design. For a reference, just had to throw that in there. There was some dispute over how Godzilla would be portrayed. Saperstein was more a fan of the heroic Godzilla, you know, sometimes a little scary, sometimes a little comedic, but a lovable hero character. Uh, Carrie Woods wanted a, quote, destructive but likable interpretation 
like they had in the Toho movies. So there was a little bit of dispute there. So then they needed a writer. Clive Barker apparently did an early pitch for the movie, but they really wanted to uh, tap into Ted Elliott and Terry Rosio. So Ted Elliott said that he was given a call, and they said, you know, Godzilla, that's, that's what we're looking for. If you are available for another project, Godzilla. And he said that he, Terry Rosio and Ted Elliott turned it down multiple times because they really didn't know what to do with Godzilla's story. So the two decided to write a, about a three and a half page story outline and that got him the job. So they showed that to Kerry Woods and Tristar to discuss it and Tristar liked the description so they gave him the go ahead to write the script. So Elliot and Rosio uh, were big sci-fi fans. Tristar was really excited that they were going to hone in on the, the, the sci-fi elements of Godzilla. Terry Rosio said, Toho insisted we not make light of the monster. That helped us find the right tone as well as social and political implications. Our intent was to take it quite seriously in the sense of treating it like a legitimate science fiction story. We wanted to create an experience that would involve some true feeling for the audience in terms of being mystified or scared or inspired as opposed to having more of a comic approach. He joked that Godzilla basically wouldn't be doing his dance from Monster Zero. They were really going with the approach that 2014 eventually went with where that Godzilla is territorial and he's a monster and he's viewed as a savior but he's still scary at heart. And when writing they actually got some requests for some design changes, very very minor. But one of the things was a secondary eyelid was something that Ted Elliott proposed like a crocodile. So there were little things that they wanted to make him more realistic. The story is actually kind of funny in that it, in some ways it kind of has to do with Mark Russell from Godzilla King of the Monsters. So Ted Elliott talked about the fact that they wanted it to be like a man and a woman story. The first draft of the screenplay was completed in November 1993 and the final draft was completed in December 1994. Now Woods and Fried were tasked with finding the director. This was probably the hardest step. Roland Emmerich turned it down as well as Dean Devlin, and Emmerich's response was bashing the entire franchise, saying, quote, how would you modernize this kind of cheese? Even Tim Burton was mentioned in early articles, and he actually was in fact approached about it, but the entire crew thought that he was just not the right fit for it. Joe Dante, the Gremlins director, was another guy that was approached, but he turned it down as well. James Cameron turned it down, citing that he actually did like the screenplay. It's just something that he couldn't envision himself directing. Both Ridley Scott and Robert Zemeckis were just, you know, added to this gigantic list of crazy directors. Joel and Ethan Cohen were actually candidates for the script, which seems like a really, really odd choice. But that never came to fruition either. However, Kerry Woods, the producer, later said, yeah, Sony never approached the Coens. So as you can guess, they tried a bunch of other names and some foreign directors, but nobody stuck. However, there was some good news. The production was halted because Metavoy, the old president of TriStar, was fired and replaced by Mark Canton. And the good thing about Mark Canton is that he actually had a good relationship with Peter Goober, and so that made things a little more smooth. Kerry Woods and Robert Fried were back on the hunt and then Tristar said that there would be a studio deadline. They said, we want a director by May 20th. However, Woods and Fried could not get another director. So Toho was also kind of frustrated. They finished Godzilla vs. Mechagodzilla 2 and they said, are we going to wait for their movie to come out or do we keep producing ours? And they said they got tired of waiting. So they just said, we're just going to keep going with our series. And obviously, they did two more movies. Henry Saperstein, he was still kind of upbeat about it. He said, I guess my my crowning glory will be when TriStar's movies release sometime in the midsummer of 1995. We've all seen this commercial, by the way, this, this Godzilla teaser from 1994. So this was, I guess, a Japan teaser. And it was put in Japan in front of Godzilla versus Mechagodzilla, which, which is it must have been really awesome for those fans at the time. In June 1994, there was still a search for a director, but they decided, Sony did, to look for the special effects for the film. So naturally, Sony Pictures Image Works decided to put their bid in to do the digital effects. They had recently worked on a film where a bus 
jumped a gap in a freeway overpass in the film Speed, directed by Jan de Bont. Remember that name for later. Basically, they sculpted some maquettes. They based some of their figures on Godzilla figures that have been released. They used some of those as scannable models. Then they replicated their own scannable model based off of a 1993 Godzilla figure. Pretty basic stuff. So at this point, Woods and Fried had actually ended their deal with Sony. However, even though they moved on to other things, they still had like obligation to finish what they started. And they got a big break when in the first week of July 1994, Jan de Bont signed on as director. He was a fan of Godzilla movies. He said he saw the original in Amsterdam when he was a kid. And he, had a, he has a good quote that I want to read. It's like some people fall in love with westerns and other things. I loved Godzilla movies. This guy was the right fit. And he'd just come off of Speed from 1994. He liked the direction they were going, he liked the producers, and he really liked the screenplay. So it seemed like it was a perfect choice as a director. 20th Century Fox decided to, you know, even though they wanted a speed sequel, they said, ah, we'll let him do this other project to keep him happy because he made us a lot of money. So we'll let him come back to speed too after he does Godzilla. A lot of people had praised Yandabon's directing style of cinematography. They said, oh, he's perfect for it because he's got these big action set pieces and he's going to fit this really nicely. So when they were all happy with the decision, he went to Toho and had a meeting. There was some dispute over the size of Godzilla. They don't really specify what height he was going to be, but I guess Jan won them over because they couldn't get around the idea of making him too big to, you know, not scale a miniature because that's what they've been used to. But they did win him over and that's pretty awesome. So production finally began and Chris Lee, the guy from earlier who is the vice president of their productions, he officially registered the corporation or inc gojira productions tristar pictures that's pretty cool that's a pretty cool name it's a nice little logo i think that's kind of cool so jan said that he hadn't had a lot of interaction with fried and woods but he did have some interactions with the line producer barry osborne so debont eventually went up and met with ted elliott and terry rosio and they back and forth discussed any story changes or anything like that and from separate interviews they both said that they enjoyed each other's company and they think that the story and the film was better for it. Jan de Bond would make changes based off of story elements or budget constraints. But Elliot and Rosio seemed very happy with this. Eventually, Jan de Bond got Boyd Shermis to do the VFX for the film, who he had collaborated with on recently on Speed, but even as far back as the 80s in some truck commercials. So Jan had talked about his directing style and then Boyd the, the special effects guy was interested in doing some experimental things and and Jan agreed with this Jan said that he was never a fan of handheld he liked steady cam but for this film in particular he was willing to experiment with it just to kind of get in the feeling of a Godzilla movie that it's hectic and disastrous and anything can happen so uh, that was one of his motivations to do some experimentation was Shermis suggesting things to him. The whole movie, everything about that movie hadn't been done, really, at that scale. And it was just going to be the way that Jan wanted to do it, and, and certainly the way I wanted to do it. it. It was just massive. When Jan and I were looking at it together, it was like, all right, well, we don't want to do that. We don't want a guy in a rubber suit. Flashing forward a couple decades, um, you know, when you look at a King Kong movie, you read emotion in King Kong's face and you look at yeah. Godzilla even, you go, oh yeah, now he's really pissed off or now he's he's heartbroken or whatever. You can read that on their faces and there was nothing about any of those early incarn incarnations where you could see any of that emotion. And we wanted to bring that to, to Godzilla. We wanted to make sure that you read him. He was the main character in that film. But, you know, he was as tall as a building. I, I think like 30 stories or more. 300 feet tall, let's say, that getting all of that in camera, you know, grounding him on the ground and showing his face in what was going to be an anamorphic, anamorphic film where your aspect ratio is wide, not tall. Um, it was going to be a, a cinematic challenge, um, not just to physically get him in frame, but to ground him and keep him in frame and to keep it the context of where he is and what he's doing and not feel like you're six blocks away. Shermis got a production designer, Joseph Nemec III, who said in an interview that he was told to 
not design anything to be pretty. He said, usually when destruction is in films, it's made to look pretty. He says, it should be chaos. Nemec said that they did have a couple of things that were designed in terms of set pieces. Obviously, both Godzilla and the Griffin were designed, along with a Japanese fishing village, an ice cave where Godzilla reappears from, and some of the military spaces. I'm not, I'm not getting into too many specifics, but I guess I will for this. The Japanese fishing village scene was one of Yandabon's favorite scenes of the film, and the first one he intended to shoot, because it was kind of Godzilla going back to the motherland, I guess. He's coming ashore during a storm, so it's it's kind of like almost exactly like his appearance in the original film. Oh, we were actually going to shoot <laughs> that as part of our pre-production, and we did get to set up some of that testing, as I was just describing, uh, but that's as far as it got. They did some location scouting in Alaska to get the scenes of the cave, and they went to Oregon to find the fishing village. Jan de Bont said later that by the time the film was canceled, every single set was designed. They had made models of the sets. There was an entire gigantic room, in fact, filled with the miniatures, and it looked really impressive. He says additionally, they scouted all the locations and had permissions for all of them. And he says that's pretty far along in movie terms. Variety would go on to report that filming was going to set to begin in November of 1994. For Godzilla's design, it was pretty simple. One of the first guys that they hired for doing some designs and some storyboards and stuff was Richard Delgado. And he has a good quote that probably should need to be heard by Roland Emmerich. If it ain't broke, why fix it? Stan Winston was not hired at this point. Actually, he had heard of the project and I think was approached by Jan de Bont. However, he wanted to try to convince Jan de Bont to hire him. So he made basically maquettes and designs not for hire. He did them for free with his team to try to convince Jan de Bont. Well, Stan was, uh, we were in conversations with Stan. And Jan and I both felt, and no disrespect to Stan or any of his work and any of the people who worked with him, but we both felt that you know the idea of trying to create an animatronic and even just small sections of you know his foot was going to be 12 feet tall or 20 feet tall and, and you know weigh several thousand pounds and just trying to get the those animatronics to work at that scale were just not going to be practical you know we didn't think that that was the right approach and and we did talk to Stan and we talked to the people at Digital Domain very in, in great detail uh, and I can only think of one uh, off the top of my head from that script and in the storyboards that we generated that would have been appropriate for an animatronic. But, you know, we, we did listen to Stan and his, his people a great deal for uh, several months. Stan had worked with some other people that he'd worked with before, including Crash McCreary. They did a really nice drawing of Godzilla that it's kind of famous now that we've all seen before. It's probably the first thing that you see when you type up Godzilla 1994. It's when he shoots the jets out of the air. Richard Delgado had worked with Ian DeBont before on speed. So he kind of sent his own application to his office and sent a couple of his drawings. And one of them was a color image that has a Godzilla, almost a Redosaurus from the Beast of 20,000 Fathoms mix to it. Uh, blowing up a building. It's a really impressive piece of art, and I'm hopefully showing it right now. Yandabon said that the Griffin monster was a very essential part of the movie because he figured Godzilla needed to have an opponent. There were some rumors, I guess, that Godzilla was fighting Ghidorah, but this was obviously not true. However, Terry Rosio uh, would indeed confirm that him and Ted Elliott intended to have King Ghidorah fight Godzilla but his rights were off limits. One interesting bit of information that again could apply to Legendary was that they, in the contract, were given the entire roster of Godzilla monsters except for Rodan, Mothra, or Ghidorah. Which now thinking about it, you wonder if Legendary has those rights as well because they specifically had to get the rights for Mothra, Rodan, and Ghidorah separately. So maybe they do have the rights to everybody else. When discussing the Griffin monster, Rosio said they wanted a flying monster. There's something great about that image, Godzilla standing his ground, an adversary attacking from above. The dynamics of that battle just become more interesting. We also wanted to play into the conceit that our cultural myths recorded previous attacks 
and predicted future battles. So we searched for a creature supported by Western mythology. And then the beauty of the griffin is that it seems constructed of several Earth creatures, which led us to the notion of an alien type probe that would construct a creature out of collected Earth type DNA. Uh, he was going to be probably more difficult than Godzilla. Uh, I think maybe one of the advantages to the griffin is that more often than not, you know, he was in the air. Uh, or he had certainly had that ability, and so he's not grounded. One of the sculptors, Carlos Juante, I really hope I'm saying his name right, had no other references but the screenplay descriptions of the griffin in the probe bats, so it was basically up to him to create the design. The description he was given was that the griffin is a planet-conquering doomsday beast. It has a leathery body, blood-red wings like a bat, the body of a mountain lion, smooth and slick skin, eyes that glow yellow in the darkness, reflecting like the eyes of a cat, a hydra-headed thing, squirming where the tongue should be. All of this was presented to Huante, and he had to make it up. He said, to be honest, the description of the griffin was cartoony, so for me, the challenge was to try and make it all real. An interesting thing is that the hydra tongues could kind of be a reference to King Ghidorah, because in both of his renditions of the tongues, there's three of them. He said that the griffin was always a work in progress, which was a problem because he could have been working on it forever, making small adjustments, and he was never really satisfied with it. So by the time that the project was canned, it wasn't as complete as he wanted it to be. There was also another character. So they got an illustrator, David Russell. There was a character that is sort of an alien organism that transfers one of the human characters, Marty, in the story to evolving half-human, half-alien hybrid. Jesus, this movie was nuts. In October 1994, Stan Winston finally got the job to do the monster designs and the maquettes. This was a little upsetting to Juante and uh, Delgado, who obviously were making the 2D drawings, but they actually got to start sculpting 3D models of their creatures. When Stan Winston got it, they were kind of bummed by this, but they were still excited to see what he did. So in the final months of 1994, they hired Giacomo Giazza. Wow, let's hope I got that one right. He said that he was only on the project for about three months before Sony ended it. But Yandabont liked him because he said he was pretty quick. In fact, Giazza and the other artists we mentioned earlier, David Russell, were the only two people to actually do storyboards on the movie. Here are some of the storyboards that Giazza and David Russell worked on. So this is a bit of a rough idea of just... A comparison of their art styles, they're obviously different, but here's just a couple ideas of some of the different scenes and set pieces that we would see. Uh, Godzilla with the submarine, atomic breath, some ships, the griffin stuff, Godzilla being airlifted, Godzilla inside the hangar thing, lots of really cool stuff, even, even some city battles. We have a really good one, hopefully I'm showing it right now, of Godzilla and the griffin fighting in between the Twin Towers. We didn't get to develop all the techniques, but one of the things that we did have to do, in fact, was to build into our budgets the fact that we did need to create new ways of doing things. For example, the water technology at the time uh, was nowhere near what it turned out to be you know, 10 years later when I did Poseidon, for which we had to develop new water technology. Uh, and we were going to do things not terribly dissimilar in that version of Godzilla, as I ended up doing for the Poseidon film. And so we were going to have to create new ways of dealing with the scale, combining the CGI versions of it and the practical destruction and that sort of thing just hadn't been done at that scale. One thing I definitely wanted to ask about, there is this clip online that claims that it's previs. And I was going to see maybe if you could like confirm or deny. Um, well, if you could, if you want to describe what it is, I can tell you if it's real or not. It is the Golden Gate Bridge sequence. Fake fake all right <laughs> we didn't get to get to the point of previs we did do some tests it was primarily done with uh john frazier and his team uh where uh they smashed a house a hut you know it's like an island hut where godzilla's foot comes in and stomps on this hut and just flattens it and uh you know we got a little godzilla foot in there and and that sort of thing. And, and John and his team just flattened the hut in a practical sense. Uh, and it looked great. It was going to be great, no question. But that was the, really the only thing that we managed to pull off in our period of pre-production. So they contacted ILM to do 
the effects initially. Funny enough, ILM obviously did Kong Skull Island. But even funnier, they did the Charles Barkley Godzilla commercial, which is hilarious. So a music video directed by David Fincher, obviously who directed films like Fight Club, was done with a cool special effect. So the video's love is strong. Digital Domain did the effects work on in which models were digitally enhanced to giant size and running around a city. James Cameron, co-founder of Digital Domain, said that they were looking for an entire effects facility. It was a lot of people, a lot of negotiation, a big deal, and lots of money. So in October 94, they were officially signed as the primary special effects supplier for the film. So they then decided that they would go with mocap as the best way to keep those real-life movements from the original movies. And DeBont later commented on Godzilla 98 saying, that's where they went wrong, is Godzilla didn't move naturally enough. So with Stan Winston's team building models, which later revealed they never even got to that stage, only the design and smaller maquettes, they also looked for miniature sets, and they did this at the same time. They were scanning old maquettes for the CG people. So they had three departments going at once. However, they never actually hired uh, miniature people. They almost hired Mark Stetson. He was in some talks with them, but he said he never had any involvement in it. It looked like it was going to be a very expensive movie. At, at this time, they had built the model of the Japanese fishing village, and they planned to film it in November 1994. Filming the Japanese fishing village scene was good for a couple of reasons. One, it was the first thing they were going to shoot, so it's a good way to introduce the project. Second thing, it was going to be easy for the visual effects people to finally have a reference on something. So they would get to throw in the storm effects and obviously Godzilla. Uh, another thing is that this was going to allow them to get a teaser out there, so they would actually have some footage that they could throw out for marketing. And I guess the best thing is, I mean, also, it was going to be in the film, so that helps too. They were planning on doing this teaser thing around 1995 in the summer. The good thing about this sequence is that it didn't contain any of the main characters. So extras could be used, or even not extras. They didn't even need characters for it, I don't even think. So it was a good thing to get happening early. Yon de Bont, even though the studios had promised in the press there was going to be A-list actors, he didn't want A-list actors. He said he did this for Speed and for Twister. He didn't want these kind of big actors because Godzilla was the main star. And Henry Saperstein, as we know, is the guy who got the ball rolling and all this. He echoed this and said, you know, Godzilla's the star. We don't really need this kind of thing. This idea was also echoed by the casting director, Riza or Riza Bremen Garcia. She was basically saying, I was hearing what Jan was saying. He wanted these people to follow. He wanted Godzilla to lead. She said, we did not do much casting. I remember very little. We talked about a number of people for Godzilla. I can't say who this many years later. Lists were made. Availabilities were checked. According to Terry Rosio and Chris Lee, apparently Jan DeBont wanted Helen Hunt and Bill Paxton to play Jill Llewellyn and Aaron Vaught, the main characters. Bill Paxton would eventually go on to do bigger things, including Mighty Joe Young. I actually like his character in that movie, so that's pretty cool. He said that he couldn't technically offer them anything because a picture wasn't technically greenlit, but he said he had them in mind, and obviously he would use them later in Twister. Now that pre-production was like actually getting underway, the producer, Kerry Woods, was actually comfortable enough talking about sequels. Not like saying they're going to happen, but bringing up the topic. He said, I imagine if it's successful, there's certainly a precedent for doing more than one of them. So I can't play too much of this, but you should be seeing a couple clips of Godzilla. This is actually a promo reel that was made for the Sony executives so they could actually understand Godzilla's history and his background. So just as things started to seem they were going up, it's kind of when the project was on the way down. So Jan de Bont planned to begin filming in March 1995. Principal photography would last six months, and then obviously several months of FX work and post-production and he planned to have a summer 1996 release. He said, you know, Jurassic Park is almost simple compared to this project. So the eventual downfall of this is kind of budget, but it's also kind of Sony just being stupid. I'm not going to get into too much of this backstory, but I guess to sprinkle a little bit of it into here, basically... Sony of Japan, they purchased Columbia and TriStar for 
billions of dollars in 1989. And obviously, they're not going to pay that up front. So they had some deals where they would give percentage shares of like revenues and stuff like that. They were in debt, but they weren't in a position where they could like really spend money on things. But I guess their overhead was high. Too many people were given production deals and, and their own offices and stuff like that. There wasn't a good management of money. However, they did have some successful films in the early 90s that I guess offset those costs. But then they also had a couple that lost the money. So in mid-1994, Sony apparently hired an investment bank to sell a quarter stake in the studio for $3 billion. And nobody came forward to buy it. So there was speculation that they were going to shut down or they were going to do huge layoffs and, and cuts and, and project endings and, and everything you could imagine to save money. Peter Gerber, who we know from this is the chairman of, you know, CEO of Sony, he finally resigned in late 1994. He was said to be missed. A lot of the projects that he had initiated or, or, or oversaw, I guess, or supported, Air Force One, My Best Friend's Wedding, The Mask of Zorro, and Men in Black, uh, obviously they would all have box office success. So it was, a, it was a miss from the company. An interesting little part of the deal at the end is that they gave him $40 million, but they also agreed to give him $275 million in funding to get his own independent production company, Mandalay Entertainment Group, made, which they would make movies and they would be distributed by Sony. But because of this, under the deal that they made with him, Mandalay would be allowed to take over production of some films from Columbia and TriStar. So some more boring business stuff. Basically, Sony Pictures took a big write-off of like billions of dollars of financial losses, overspendings, and then 500 million in unfinished projects. They got fined a million dollars for it, which is, for some reason, historic or something. The problem was, it was basically doom for a lot of these pictures that were not greenlit. So, obviously, Godzilla was under radar. Giazza, one of the storyboard writers, said that every one of the Godzilla crew was uh, crossing their fingers that Sony would keep the project because there were rumors that it was about to close. So, they were all kind of worried. There was a bit of a negative kind of doom feeling and chris lee you know he read through the script terry rosio and ted elliott's script and he tried to formulate budgets and stuff like that the estimated cost from the, de the from the production department was 140 to 180 million and the studios said they refused to spend more than 100 million on the movie so woods and fried who are the producers they said that sony had conjured up a quote defensive budget and basically they said it's not really our fault it's because you can't manage your money it's your financial issues Wood said, with the $140 million budget for the movie with this many effects, everybody taxed on another 30%. So the studio was looking at a movie they thought was going to be over $200 million. So one of the people working for one of the digital effects companies, Digital Domain, said, Devon didn't understand what was really involved. He said he wanted a completely computer-animated Godzilla, which is possible, it's just expensive. Terry Rosio recalled the line producer looking at one of their pages and saying, this is a $6 million page where Godzilla fights the Griffin uh, around the World Trade Center. So it was certainly just, it was a lot to take in for a lot of people. As Rosio said, and as I'll repeat, it is hard to get to the perspective of the time, but you have to. At this time, CG was viable, but it really wasn't to this extent. The only way it would be is if they had a lot of money. Like we said, they were trying to fund new animating programs to figure out different textures and stuff. You look at Godzilla 98. Yes, it was three or four years later. But technology goes fast, right? So they just weren't in the position to really do this. Some insiders had to reassure the public, so they told Variety and Exclusive that, you know, the picture is going to be made. It's just going to have to be made responsibly, reworking scenes, cutting things down to get the budget down. So there was a last-ditch effort in November and December to meet with TriStar and try to convince them otherwise. So DeMont met with them, and the crew brought over some of Stan Winston's maquettes and artwork, some of the storyboards, a couple of the miniatures, to try to show them, you know, we have something here. Jan DeMont said multiple people at Sony just didn't get Godzilla. They said they wanted to make him more Americanized and more designs that resembled T-Rexes because they figured that that would be the way to get the most audience outreach. But, you know, obviously Jan de Bont said that's never what we wanted. He said, quote, they don't know anything about Godzilla. 
Rosio and Elliot decided to do a final revision screenplay, so that was given in on December 9th, 1994. The new draft had a budget of around $120 million. $50 million of that would be devoted to the FX. Looking back, Yondabont said that that film could have easily been made, that revised screenplay, for a reasonable amount of money, saying that there were fewer big scenes in that than even the 1998 movie. So Jan said that he was making his case and Sony kept rejecting his revisions and his offers, saying it can't be more than a hundred million. He argued that Barry Osborne, the line producer, you know, he's a big producer, he's worked on these big movies, he knows how to budget them, he knows how to get them done. But the studios just kept telling Jan de Bont, we need somebody that can do it for less. And Jan de Bont said, that's a typical bullshit studio argument. They tried to find all kinds of arguments. However, because Peter Gerber at this point had set up Mandalay Pictures, he decided the first project he wanted would be Godzilla. However, you guessed it, Sony strayed him away from that. So the talks between Sony and Yandabon continued, but they were really going nowhere and they complained that he was too difficult, he was too tough, and he didn't want to do certain things. By mid-December that year, there was within industry rumors that the Bond would be quitting to take the Twister movie, uh, or Face Off at Paramount. TriStar, however, really wanted him in the movie, so their last ditch effort was a meeting where they told him the Griffin has to be cut from the movie. The suggestion was not well received by the Bond. That's the whole point I was trying to make to them. I said, have you ever looked at any Godzilla movies? The Griffin was a perfect opponent for Godzilla and they wanted to cut it. We were all so upset about it. Yandamont would go on and say that these decisions were based on the money, and that's the business. The decisions weren't based off of is it's good for the movie, is it good for the characters. It was all about saving money. So he soon started realizing that nobody, Sony, TriStar, really gave a shit about the movie. They cared about the bucks it would bring in. So he was getting very, very upset with it. Ted Elliott eventually said that they never actually revised the screenplay version without their Griffin in it. However, there was another idea that a second monster other than the Griffin would be in the film. Terry Rosio revealed that Sony made a request at one point that we create a sidekick Robin to Godzilla's Batman. He said that, you know, at, at the time it seemed like that would increase the budget. However, Sony saw this as a way to, you know, make a spin off, serialize the character, and maybe even make a sequel without Godzilla, which obviously they were not a fan of. It turns out later that actually Toho didn't like the idea either. So eventually on the day after Christmas 1994, Jan Debont was paid his $4 million and he left the project. Debont said that he would go in, submit a film version that was $5 million less, they'd ask for five less than that, he'd do that, they'd ask for five less than that, and he said the back and forth really just wasn't worth it anymore. Ultimately, the budget disillusioned everybody, and unfortunately the project just ended. Now obviously they would hold on to the rights and try to rework their Americanized idea, but you have to realize how expensive this movie was going to be. Adjusted for inflation from 1994, this would cost 227 to 261 million dollars. That's more expensive than any of the MonsterVerse movies, just for some perspective. And this didn't even have any A-list actors in it. The sad thing is that when the crew got the call that the film was cancelled and Yondabon left, they were building the first set in Oregon, which is truly a sad story. But you know what happens after with Godzilla 1998. It was never officially greenlit. You know, there's a term for actors and directors uh, called pay or play, where studio commits to making the movie uh, by ultimately committing to the actors and the directors and their paychecks. And we weren't to that level. We, we weren't to that point. Uh, we were in pre-production. We did six months or more of pre-production. It was a big challenge and I was taking it very, very seriously and spending all my time trying to figure out how we we're going to do it and trying to round up the team that was going to be able to do it. And uh, on top of all of that, Toho was very involved and they wanted to make sure that this first big American version was going to be a huge success. And so they were very on top of what we were doing in terms of design, in terms of the script, in terms of the the, the production execution that we were planning. Uh, you know, Roland has his own style and, you know, love him or hate him. He, you know, he just likes big and bombastic and, and more is better. Uh, whereas I think Jan was a little bit more 
auteur about it. That is to say, you know, he, he wanted to make it more about uh, Godzilla and his his journey. The fact that this movie didn't come out is a tragedy. The amount of people that were working on the movie and just the enthusiasm that all of them had. Uh, you know, everybody from Henry Saperstein and, uh, you know, Carrie Woods and uh, Chris Lee and Peter Gruber, people risking their jobs to get this movie made, people devoting all of their time into it. Uh, I mean, you even heard Boyd Chermis in my interview with him. He He's not even a, a monster movie fan. And he said, you know, we recognized it was a big property. We had a big responsibility. Uh, and obviously, Jan de Bont, who was a huge Godzilla fan, or is a huge Godzilla fan, he was really treating this seriously. And the fact that this movie wasn't made is a crime. And it's kind of like the right people at the right time at the wrong studio. Uh, so many was in debt, as as I mentioned, and as Boyd talked about. You know, they could have probably made this movie and, and taken an initial loss, but, you know, made their money back later. But... I don't work at Sony, I can't make any recommendations. Um, a really good tidbit of information, which I might have mentioned in the documentary, I can't remember, but Terry Rosio, who wrote the story for this movie with Ted Elliott, he actually wrote the story of Godzilla vs. Kong. So how many of the elements of this film did he put into GVK? You know, certainly the more sci-fi mythic fantasy elements are in there. So I want to know what you guys thought about this movie. What aspect of it did you uh, do you think was the most missed in Godzilla 1998. And because I did work pretty hard on this thing, share it around with everybody you know, make a post about it, who knows, put it on a Reddit somewhere, put it put it on the Godzilla Reddit, I don't know. I just want people to be able to see this, uh, you know, even if this is something that gets a lot of views today, I just want it to be something that's just out there. You know, if people are on the internet and they want to know more about the movie, here is their comprehensive look at it. That was the idea.